Hi class, welcome to our module on lifespan psychology. This is probably one of my favorite topics in the course. I think this is the most interesting as we think about all of the experiences throughout our lifespan and how they have an effect on who we are. But before we get started in thinking about all of the different experiences we have and what happens in terms of our development across the lifespan, we need to take a look at how lifespan psychology is studied. And that's what you're going to be learning about in this particular video. So if you'll remember in module one, you learned about the various ways that we can study behavior. You learned about naturalistic observation, case study research. Remember, case study research is where you study a rare person or a rare group of people or perhaps an unusual event. You learned about experimental research. And if you'll remember, this is where we have random assignment into experimental and control groups. You learned about, in this type of research, independent and dependent variables, and that this is the only method that allows us to really establish if there is a cause and effect relationship. You also learned about survey research and the importance of having a representative sample. You learned about uh, when survey research can be very valuable and the types of information we might get from this type of research. And you also learned about correlational research where we can examine the relationship between two or more variables but that this type of research does not allow us to establish cause and effect. It only tells us about the relationship or patterns that we see between those two or more variables. Well, in lifespan psychology, we can use each of these methods, but we also find that longitudinal and cross-sectional research methods are very helpful approaches to understanding the changes that take place over time. So in this video, you're going to be learning about the way that we can study development over the lifespan. So let's assume that we are researchers who are interested in studying human development and we're doing a research study on language and how that changes over the lifespan. So perhaps we want to know about vocabulary size. For example, we might want to know how many words does someone know? at different points in time throughout the lifespan. And so we know, for example, that infants may know the least amount of words and then teenagers would know more and then adults would know more than them. And maybe we want to know, again, the number of words that each of these age groups tend to know on average. So we have two important questions that we need to answer. How many age groups do we want to study? And then how many times do we want to study them? So let's start by looking at something called a cross-sectional research design. And you'll see these two questions and how they're answered in this type of design. So a cross-sectional design is going to measure multiple groups of people at one point in time. So here on your screen, you'll see three different groups. We'll call these groups cohorts. So we have a group of two-year-olds in cohort A, and we have a group of 12-year-olds in cohort B, and we have a group of 22-year-olds in cohort C. So why would we use this type of design? Well, first of all, it's very quick as an approach to studying changes across the lifespan. We just measure vocabulary in each of these groups one time. So I can get three groups of people of different ages and then measure them one time and then compare the three groups. I don't have to follow them over time. It's not very expensive. I don't have to worry about something called a practice effect. So what this means is that sometimes if we study people over time, people will get better at what you're testing them in. So let's say, for example, we have a basic vocabulary type of task that we're giving these people in this study. Well, the more you take that vocabulary or you engage in that particular vocabulary task, the better you're going to get at it. Let's say we were to do a study 
um, investigating vocabulary, and maybe we were using crossword puzzles. Maybe we have some people who are older in our study. So we wouldn't obviously use two-year-olds. Maybe we're going to use um, 10-year-olds, 15-year-olds, and 20-year-olds. Well, the more practice that one group has, the better they're going to get over time, right? And so it may not be that if we see differences between those groups that it's due to age differences, it may be due to practice differences, having had more experience with that particular type of task. So here, we don't have to worry about that because each group would only be getting this vocabulary task or if we were doing the crossword puzzle type of task, they're only getting it one type. Now, there is a big limitation of this type of study and it's something called the cohort effect. So this means that one of the groups are different and it's not because of their age, but it's something about that group that makes them unique that may affect the results of the study. So let's say, for example, that the 22 year olds were in high school during a time that there was a national program to promote vocabulary. So this means that the 22 year olds have a different feature about them that isn't just related to their age, and this particular feature may affect their vocabulary. And so while we may see a particular level of vocabulary among the 22 year old, that might not be typical because remember, they were participating in a unique national program to enhance vocabulary. And so we would want to be able, we'd want to be able to take that into consideration. And sometimes when you're doing a study like this, a cross-sectional study, there can be unique features that a particular group has that may affect the results of the study. Our next type of design is called a longitudinal design. A longitudinal design is the opposite of a cross-sectional design, and this is because we're studying only one group of people and we're studying them over a period of time at multiple points in time. So instead of three age groups, we're studying one group at three different points in time. We're studying them when they're two, and then we're studying them again when they're 12, and then we're studying them again when they're 22. So if you think about it, I'm measuring age differences in a cross-sectional design, but I'm measuring age change in a longitudinal design. So why would I use this design? Well, this can be a great type of design because I can study specific people over time. I can study, for example, Samantha when she's two, and then I can study her again 10 years later. Um, and I can see specifically what Samantha's growth is. And this gives me a sense of earlier and later links because I got to see Samantha at earlier and later times. A limitation of this is that it can be much more expensive. So if I'm going to study people from the age of two to the age of 22, I have to follow them for 20 years. And this is going to cost a lot of money. Also, we have what's called repeated testing. Maybe people get better at the test since they've taken it more than one time. And then we have what's called attrition, and this is where people will drop out of the study. So we have, let's say, 102-year-olds that we start with. We can hope that they will want to come back over the next 20 years, but we're likely going to find that several of our participants may not. Now, I wanna give you a great example of a longitudinal study. And this is a very well-known study where researchers wanted to study the effects or the long-term effects of high quality early child care and education on low income three and four year olds. And so they followed these kids that participated in these high quality preschool programs and they followed them for 35 or 37 years. And what they found is that at the age of 40, that those who were participating in this preschool program in their early years have higher earnings, they're more likely to hold a job and have committed fewer crimes and are more likely to have graduated from high school than those who did not participate in high quality uh, early education. 
So overall, what the study uh, suggested was very interesting is that there was a return to society of more than $16 for every tax dollar invested in early care and education programs. So this was a study that was conducted over four decades. And because you can, you're hearing the great benefits of this, of this type of educational program, you could imagine then how beneficial this type of study would be in helping to support the use of taxpayer dollars to provide high quality early care to children. So this is, I think, a great example of a longitudinal study. And by the way, this study is still ongoing. So the other type of method that we're going to look at now, the third one, is what's called sequential design. And a sequential design, as you can see from this image, it's a combination of the longitudinal and cross-sectional approaches. So this design is going to measure age differences, but it's also going to measure age changes. So in this type of study, we have multiple age groups and multiple time points. So we have three different groups measured at three different time points. And this is the strongest method of research when we're studying human development because it will show us everything we need to know about development. It will show us group differences, and it will get rid of any cohort issues that we might have. So remember, I gave you that example of cohort C, maybe uh, having gone to high school during a time when there was a unique national vocabulary program. So we'll know in this type of study if that cohort is a little unusual or if that group is different at, um, at, a, at, at time point three when I compare them to cohort B and A that are also going to be 22 at that point in time. So it will help me to rule out the cohort effects as a problem. But a limitation of this type of study is that it is very time consuming. So let's say it takes 20 years and I have 100 people in each study now or in each group. Now I have 300 people. That's also going to cost me a lot of money. So what have you learned today? Well, you've learned that cross-sectional designs involve studying multiple ages at one point in time. You learned that longitudinal designs involve studying one group of people at multiple points in time, and that sequential designs involve studying multiple ages at multiple points in time. So let's check your learning. Let's start with the first question. In a developmental study, researchers assess self-confidence in a group of five-year-olds. So they then follow up with the same group when they're 10 years old, and then again when they're 15-year-olds. So what type of developmental design does this study utilize? So take a moment to think about this. So if you said longitudinal, you're right. This study involves studying one group of people at different points in time. We're studying these people when they're five, then again when they're 10, and then again when they're 15. So let's try one more. Here we go. In order to study health, researchers ask participants to fill out a survey about their diet and physical activity. The participants are either in their 50s, in their 60s or in their 70s. What type of developmental design does this study utilize? So take a moment to think about this. Is it cross-sectional, longitudinal, or sequential? If you said cross-sectional, you're right. You're studying multiple groups of people at one point in time. One group is in their 50s, one group is in their 60s, and one group is in their 70s. So what will you be learning about next? In the next video, you're going to be learning about the brain changes that take place across the lifespan. We're going to look at the brain in prenatal development, infancy and toddlerhood, and then into early and middle childhood, and then adolescence, and then through adulthood into late adulthood. Until then, please don't hesitate to let me know what questions you have.